echo that. All right, let me open in prayer, and then we're going to open up to Daniel chapter 6. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity. God, we thank you for the work that is going, around, going on around the world, uh, in this country, in our communities, and beyond to all sorts of countries and places where the gospel needs to be preached. We thank you for all our missionaries. We pray for them even this morning, that you would use them in a mighty way to bring freedom to the captives, God. I pray that you might do that to bring your deliverance that you've promised us through your word that many of us have been delivered from sin and darkness and death but there are those who still haven't and I pray that you might do that today. God, as we go to Daniel 6, would you, op- would you open our minds as we look to it and think about it and study it? God, may this be more than just a story that we're told as kids but allow this to be something that will change the way we choose to live in the day we live right now. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we will be in Daniel chapter 6, and uh, it is a very familiar story. Uh, Many of you, uh, if you hear the word Daniel, the first thing you probably think is lion's den. Uh, That is one of the uh, key stories that ends up coming out from the book of Daniel, that along with Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and we see Daniel 6 come out as well. Uh, There's all sorts of Kids' stories, kids' movies, and so much more that we hear about Daniel chapter 6 when we hear about Daniel being delivered from the lion's den. But again, as we've looked through the whole book, I'm hoping that today may be our perspective on what we see happening in the book of Daniel, and specifically in Daniel chapter 6, is that there's a bigger thing going on than just a faithful person who prays getting delivered from lions. Yes, that is the plot of what we see happen, but... Again, as we think about the theme, we think about how everything binds together through the book of Daniel and actually through the whole Bible, we see that there's an even deeper, bigger uh, truth that we can hang on to. Uh, even in, in our situation, in, it, it, this is a universal application, not just for um, Daniel at the time when he's delivered from the lions. And we'll look at that today. But I want to start by uh, thinking about things that people uh, decide are impossible uh, and there's, there's any number of things we could talk about. Uh, and today, our title is Our Irrevocable God. The fact that God cannot be changed or change. And uh, the, the language of irrevocable is seen here in Daniel chapter 6. And I'm just going to give you that spoiler right out the bat. I, I think that's used as a way to contrast what man thinks is impossible, God can do. What man thinks is irrevocable, God can change, because he's the only one that's really unchangeable and irrevocable. And so we're going to look at that today, but I was drawn to think about the story of the Titanic, and many of you know the Titanic story. You've watched the movie, you've studied the, uh, the history, and the Titanic was built to be a wonderful marvel of man's invention. They had it all figured out. The Titanic was going to be the greatest cruise ship. It was going to be wonderful and luxurious and all of those things. But the biggest thing it claimed more than anything else was that it was unsinkable. That was the, the, the boast of those who made the Titanic. This is unsinkable. No matter what happens, this boat will not go down. But you know how the story ends. Very first journey. Didn't even like have a long life and then go down. Very first journey, Titanic sets out, hits an iceberg, and does what everyone said was not possible. It sunk. And many lives were lost. Many lives were lost. And a lot of that is attributed to even the idea of the pride that was still happening even at the time. People refusing to get into lifeboats because they didn't need to be saved. They didn't need to be delivered because the boat's unsinkable. So why would we get in a lifeboat? Why would we be afraid? What we'll see today is what man thinks is impossible, what man thinks is unsinkable, what man thinks is irrevocable is not for God. God can and will do all things that he decides and desires to do. And we're going to see that as we look through the book, uh, the chapter of Daniel chapter 6. But before we read Daniel chapter 6, and we will read the whole chapter, so we will be ready for that. So you might want to turn there and get ready. They're not going to be up on the screen. You're going to have to look at paper, uh, or, or I guess your screen. But uh, let's look at the theme of Daniel. We want to remember what we're looking at as we look through the whole book. And the, the theme of Daniel, as we've been presenting it, as we've looked at, as we've seen to be true, is the gospel of God's sovereignty. 
the good news of God's sovereignty, that God is sovereign. God is ruler, God is over all, and he is all-powerful, and he is in control. We see that this is good news for us. See, and I understand that for some people to think about the fact that God is always in control, it might make us nervous, it might make us uh, frightful, but that's not the point. As God's people, as we see through the book of Daniel, yes, there are things that will happen that are scary, and things that we don't understand, and things that we just don't think quite make sense, but... In the end, it is good news to know that God is in control and he cares about his people. And so, as I've thought about, I didn't want to give the theme of every single chapter, that would take forever, but as I thought about two sub-themes that kind of nestle under our main theme of the gospel of God's sovereignty, the first place we see God's sovereignty so far in Daniel is that God is sovereignly faithful to his people. We saw that in Daniel chapter 1. Remember, God... protects and provides and uh, cares for the Daniel and his three friends, even though they don't go through the, the, same, uh, the same ways that the other people around them do. God preserves them and promotes them and shows that he is faithful even in the midst of a foreign nation, even in the midst of indoctrination, all of that. But God preserved his people. God was faithful to his people. We saw in Daniel chapter 3, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we see God's faithfulness to his people. Uh, We even see through the fact that Daniel is involved in all of the things that are happening in Babylon, showing that, again, God is faithful to his people. Daniel had nothing in and of himself that would provide for him to be able to have the influence that he was given throughout the things we've seen, except for God's faithfulness to him. And we even saw it last week. Even in the midst of God's judgment on Babylon, we see God's faithfulness to Daniel, because at the end, remember, that he is promoted, he is given Uh, promotion because, again, God has been faithful. God is moving. God is working in Daniel's life. So that's the first sub-theme under our major theme. And the second way God shows his sovereignty is that he is the sovereign ruler over all kings and over all nations. We've seen that through all of the different, uh, the visions that Daniel has been allowed to, that God has interpreted through Daniel. We've seen that God is the ruler over all kings, over all nations, that there is no one who can set themselves against God who is higher or stronger or mightier or able to do anything without the power of God. God is the one who sets up kings. He is the one who takes down kings. He is the one who sets up kingdoms. He is the one who raises kingdoms. It is God. He is the sovereign ruler. So not only do we see his sovereignty in his faithfulness to his people, but we see his sovereignty in the fact that he rules over all. And those two things point again to the gospel of God's sovereignty. This is good news. Because not only is he in control of all things, not only is he reigning over all things, but he's faithful to his people. And that is good news as you put those together. And we're going to see the same thing coming out today. And our main point for Daniel chapter 6 is going to be this. God alone is able to deliver his people from death. It's a simple statement. But again, God alone is able to deliver his people from death. Deliverance is a theme that we see here, but it's not a deliverance that Daniel was able to deliver himself. It wasn't that Darius was able to deliver Daniel. It was that God delivered his people. God delivered his person. He delivered Daniel. So we're going to look at that today in Daniel chapter 6. So let's read the passage. So join me as we read Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them were three high officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps could give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set, over him, to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they couldn't find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed 
according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, who he, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at the break of the day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths that they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be brought up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the king of Cyrus the Persian. A lot here, right? There's a, it's, a, it's a lot going on. And we're going to try to get through this so that we can see what is going on. And as we see what goes on in this story, what happens in Daniel's life, then I want to take, make some implications about what we can see from it. So, as we look at this main point that God alone is able to deliver his people from death, we see again that this is, just like the rest of the book, this chapter is not primarily about Daniel. It's not about the lions. It's not about Darius. This chapter is about God. It's about his sovereignty. It's about his faithfulness. And we will see that clearly as we continue to look at this passage. So to start with, we see the foundation, the setting, how, how we get to where we're going to get, how we get to the point where Daniel's about to be thrown into the lion's den, and we start with the foundation. We see what, we can, what is going on. And the first thing we see right in chapter 6, right off the bat, is that Daniel faithfully served God and the new king. God faithfully served God and the new king. We see that Darius, by the way, if we remember back from chapter 5, Darius is the one who takes over. The Medo-Persian Empire comes in to take over Babylon, and Darius is the king. And remember, if, as Justin ended last week, we talked about who Darius is, and uh, it does seem pretty likely that this Darius is the same as Cyrus the Great. So Cyrus and Darius are one and the same, but Daniel knows him as Darius, and so that's the name he's given here in chapter 6 as well as chapter 5. 
So Darius is now king over the kingdom. He is ruling over the Medo-Persian Empire, and he decides that he needs to set up a government that is going to protect him, and a government that's going to be able to rule the, the, the nation that he, the kingdom that he is over. And Daniel's a part of that. And we see that Daniel is continuing to serve God. We're going to see that through the whole chapter. He's also serving the new king. He's doing well. We're told here that there is no one like him. Darius sees Daniel's spirit and is planning a promotion because in the midst of a corrupt government, Daniel is standing out. We see in, uh, where we get the corrupt government. Well, the whole idea that he has to set all of this up so that there's three people over the 120. And it says so that the king will not suffer any loss. In other words, so that no one will swindle or cheat the king out of what is due him. And he's going to put Daniel in one of the, he's put Daniel in one of these three spots that is overseeing all the rest, all 120. He is overseeing. And Darius is to the point where he's going to make him his right-hand man. That's where Daniel has progressed. And again, I want to point out, this is not just because Daniel's a really good guy or a really good leader, although those things are probably true. It's because God has blessed him from the time he's come into exile until now. And God has given him a spirit of wisdom. God has given him everything that he needs to not only survive Babylon, but thrive in Babylon and thrive in uh, in now Medio Persia. And we're going to see that happen. So in the midst of this corruption, Daniel stands out. He's a man of integrity. And to point out, as we talk about God being irrevocable, unchangeable, uh, we see that Daniel, at this point, I find this very interesting, that there is a kingdom change, there is a regime change, like, there is a complete change, like, this isn't just like a little change, this is going from one kingdom to another kingdom, new kings, new everything, and what do we see? Daniel is still in the same place he was before. This is amazing to think about, because if you think about how it would normally work, a new king would come in, a new government would come in, and they'd want to just completely clean house. Right? That's what we see even in our government. Like when a new president comes in, they don't keep anybody from the, the last administration. They clean, they clean house. They get everything out. They get every person out. But God is working in Daniel so that even though the kingdom changes, even though the regime changes, God keeps him not only alive, but keeps him in an influential uh, situation, an influential position. And so I think what we can even see from this is that regimes and nations come and go, right? Regimes, nations, kingdoms, they come and go. They're revocable. They can be changed. They can be done away with. However, God's faithfulness never changes. His sovereignty never changes. There is no change to him. No matter how many kingdoms change or nations change or how many differences or changes happen even in our nation, it doesn't matter. God does not change. He is irrevocable. Whereas kingdoms and nations come and go, God does not. And we're going to see this theme continuing throughout the rest of this chapter. God's rule, God's sovereignty is never revoked. It is never uh, impossible it is never made to be changed it is impossible to be changed and so we even see that at the very beginning of this chapter even in that this reading between the lines that Daniel is even still there and he is still influential and God has still put him in this position under Darius and so because of this because Daniel faithfully served God and the new king he's going to be receiving a promotion he's one he's already highest in the kingdom and Daniel's enemies plotted against him That's what we see in the next section, the high officials and the satraps. uh, They come by agreement to the king. And and before that, we see that they even admit that there is nothing wrong with Daniel. So basically, these guys, what we come to presume, and although this text doesn't say this, it seems to be pretty obvious, are pretty jealous of where Daniel's at. They want his position. They don't agree that he should be in that position. And so they decide, what are we going to do to get him out of here? What are we going to do to make sure that Daniel is not a problem for us? What are we going to do to make sure that we're put in a position that is as high, if not higher, than him? And so they start thinking about what it could be. And they can't find anything. They're looking for corruption. They're looking for anything they can grasp onto. And Daniel is living a blameless life. They can't find anything. He is a man of integrity. No doubt, again, because of the grace and power of God. So they have to plot against him. And what they have to do is they have to find out that if, if his integrity and wisdom is not going to allow us to find anything to, to hold against him, we're going to have to make something up. That's basically what they do, and they say, what can we make up that will get Daniel in trouble? Well, there's one thing they know about Daniel. Beyond the fact that he's a man of integrity and beyond the fact that he is a man that has great influence, 
They understand and know, because obviously Daniel had not made this a secret, that Daniel followed Yahweh, God, the God of Israel. And they knew that. They knew he, his God was the one thing that he would never turn his back on. That if they were going to find anything against him, it was going to have to be regarding his religion, is what they would have called it. That's what they would have said. So they had to make a law that they knew Daniel would break, since they obviously knew about his devotion to God, and they knew about his prayer life. They knew about it. We're going to see that throughout this chapter. They knew where to find him when he's praying, and I'm getting ahead a little bit. But the whole point is, these guys, the, the, the enemies, as we'll call them, the, the, his colleagues, but yet enemies all at the same time. And we see that they're plotting against Daniel. They plotted against him. And part of this plotting is, okay, we're going to go to King Darius. We're going to tell him he needs to make this law that no one should, to, should give any petition to any god or any man except through or to King Darius. And so they come and they do this. Darius ends up signing an irrevocable law. So the enemies plot against him, and Darius ends up signing this irrevocable law. The politicians manipulate Darius into commanding that all prayers go to him or through him. It's a, little bit un, it's a little hard to see here. A lot of times we just see this and we say, well, Darius is just like Nebuchadnezzar here. He just wants everyone to pray to him. I think there's more going on here. I actually think uh, what the officials are trying to get Darius to do is to make sure that the whole kingdom understands that if they want to worship, it's going to have to go through him. He's going to have to be the one that is the one in charge of religions because he just took over a new kingdom. Think about this. If there's lots of different religions and there's no central point where people are going to be making their petitions and making their prayers, then there's a potential for disunity. There's a potential for, uh, for rebellion. There's a potential for all of these things. And I think this is a political move by Darius. I don't think this is just a religious, prideful move the way it was with Nebuchadnezzar, who Nebuchadnezzar just wanted all the glory for himself. I think Darius understood that he needed to bring everyone together for unity, and he thought, well, this, what these guys are telling me to do, this probably could work. And so he goes ahead and he signs this irrevocable law that every time someone's going to pray to any god or make any petition of anybody, that they have to go through Darius to get to God. That is obviously still idolatry. That is obviously still not worshiping God and God alone. And we know that Daniel's not going to be able to do that because he has made a commitment. He has a covenant with God. He has a covenant with the covenant-keeping God. And so just like Daniel's enemies know, we even know as the reader that this is not going to make a difference for Daniel. And indeed, that's what we'll see in just a moment. So Darius signs this law, and as I said, he calls it irrevocable. It can't be revoked. In other words, it can't be changed. Nothing and no one can change this law. It's by the, the rule of the Medes and Persians. You're not allowed to change laws. I think this was basically set up so that uh, there was less opportunity for corruption and less opportunity for uh, changing things even through as kings would change and things like that. The understanding that is very obvious from Darius and from all his officials is once you sign this law, there's nothing that can be done to stop it. It's irrevocable. It's unstoppable. It's unsinkable. There's no way that you can do anything to get this out of the way. That in and of itself is prideful, saying that there is no way that this law can be revoked. And what we're going to see through the rest of the story is God does revoke this law. God does what man says is impossible. What is irrevocable is changeable by God because God is the only one who is unchangeable. So my question I wrote here was, no one can change this. No king can change it. Not even the king himself. Not even King Darius himself. But the question we have to ask, but is there really anything unchangeable for the king of kings? And of course the answer is no. So we see that this, all, this is all the setting. We see that God, Daniel was serving God. He was faithful. Nothing could be found. So the enemies plot against him and then this, the law is signed. And now as readers, we're having, we're having to think this is, this is not good for Daniel. So what is he going to do? Well, let's see what happens next as we look at the accusation. We see that Daniel's enemies accuse him. What do they accuse him of? Well, they don't accuse him of a lie. They actually accuse him of the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is what Daniel does. Daniel faithfully worshipped God even in spite of the law. Daniel faithfully worshipped God in spite of this law. So, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went into his house where he had windows in his upper chamber towards, and opened towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God 
as he had done previously. So let's make a few uh, just observations here. So the, politician, or the politicians have manipulated Darius, and now we see Daniel heard about the new law. This is important. Daniel heard about the new law. What he chose to do was not out of ignorance. It wasn't as if we could say that in this story, Daniel prayed because he didn't know what was going on, and he just prayed anyway, and he was trapped. Like Daniel knew what he was doing. Daniel was wanting to do what he was doing. He knew what the law was, and he went and did what he always did anyway. He prayed to God, worshipped God, prayed and thanked him for three times a day, as it says he had been doing, as he had already been doing. Daniel's habit of praying and praising Yahweh would not be stopped. This was his habit. He knew it was something that God had asked of him to worship Yahweh and worship him alone. So he went on doing what he had always done and didn't make excuses. Notice here that Daniel didn't say, well, all I have to do is close my windows or all I have to do is wait 30 days and then I can pray. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't look at any of that. He could have justified any number of reasons. Well, I don't, I'll just hide when I pray or I just won't pray for 30 days. It's only 30 days. Then once that 30 days has passed, then I can pray to God again. I think this is a challenge for us to think about. Daniel didn't make any provision for sin. I think often we can say, well, this is only temporary, so I can get away with not doing what I know God has called me to do. Something to think about. But in this, we also, I also want to point out that he didn't go out of his way to openly defy or disobey Darius. He obeyed God, which naturally led to disobedience of the law. So I, here's what I want to say about this. As we look at Daniel, he didn't go out into the middle of the street with a protest sign and, and yell out his prayers to God as a sign of defiance. He didn't make this a point of, I'm going to go make sure everyone possibly knows that I'm breaking this law. I'm going to show the king that he's wrong. I'm going to show the world that they're wrong. I'm going out and I'm just going to uh, pray myself around and pray my prayers around so that, yes, I know I'll be caught, but I'm going to make a point. He doesn't do that. And I, maybe you didn't think that's a big deal. I, I think it is. Because at that point, it would have been about him, not about God. It would have been about showing that he's faithful. No, he is faithful, but he didn't need to show that. He didn't need men to see that. He didn't have to be openly defiant or openly disobedient. Here's what he did. He obeyed God, which, by, like I said, that naturally means he disobeyed the law. He didn't set out to disobey Darius. He set out to obey God. I think there's a difference that we need to understand that. Because I think a lot of times in our lives, I think we, we confuse that. We think that disobedience of something that we don't like, or some, disobedience even that is something that is not, not right, it is legitimately wrong, that we need to disobey that. And that's our God-given ability, that's our God-given calling. Can we look at it in the other sense and say, no, we obey God. And if, we, if obeying God means that other things are going to be disobeyed, then yes, that's going to be a natural result. But if we set out just to be disobedient or rebellious, that's not the heart of what God wants here. And we see it in Daniel. Daniel continues to do what he's always done. He doesn't do anything different. He doesn't make a big deal of it. He just continues to do what he's always done because he knows that's what's right to do. He knows that he needs to obey God, and that's what he does. We see that Daniel was not only praying to God, but he was thanking him. We see later as, the, as his enemies come and see him, they say that he's pleading to God. We see that he is petitioning God. Uh, maybe Daniel at this point, was praying like the, the prayer we see in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, I'm not going to read Daniel chapter 9. We'll be, we'll be there in, uh, well, a little over a month, but we'll be there in, in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to see what Daniel prayed, but he was praying in Daniel chapter 9. If you want to go and look at that, you can see what he's praying for. He's praying, he's petitioning and pleading for God to bring the deliverance that he's promised, to bring the Jews back to their land, and he's pleading with God. He's thanking God for what he's done, and he's, he's even confessing the sin of the people. And as you look at Daniel chapter 9, the timeline is the same. This is happening in the same year. So actually, here in chapter 6, it's likely, it's possible, I guess, that he's actually even praying the prayer that's in, in Daniel chapter 9 as he gets caught praying. I don't know that for sure, so please don't, that's not inspired. But what we do know is that Daniel is a man who prayed, and we see what he prayed in Daniel 9, and that he's doing it here in chapter 6. And so in chapter 6, he continues to pray. And we see that even as he's, his windows are open to Jerusalem. This was not something that was a superstitious thing. His windows were open to Jerusalem. It sounds like they were already open. Because let, let's think about it. He, 
he as a Jew would be desiring to be going back to Jerusalem. He knows that the people have been told in 70 years of captivity, then they will be set free to go back to their home. And he knows that from the prophet Jeremiah. He knows that from uh, just knowing what's going on and what God has told him. And now he's looking to Jerusalem, waiting for that day to come. And so it does make sense, again, that's what he's praying in Daniel 9, that God would restore his people. But the point here is that Daniel continues to pray, does what he's always done, is faithfully obedient to God even in the midst of knowing what this law is. So Daniel's enemies then show up. Daniel's enemies accused Daniel before Darius. So they didn't accuse him of a lie, they accused him of the truth. I love how it says here that they found him. Uh, Let's see, where does it say that? Um... Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea, almost like he had to be like, it was hide and seek, seek. But that's not, they found him because they were looking for him. They set him up. So he's set up, they were looking, they probably, if they had binoculars, they'd be looking through his window, waiting to see him do this. And indeed, Daniel isn't hiding, right? He didn't hide, he's doing it as he's always done it, and he's open, and they know where to find him, and they catch him. And then they remind the king, before they even talk about Daniel, they go back to the king and they say, hey, remember this law you passed? You said that people had to pray only to and through you. And and well, you know, you said that this can't be changed. And if that happens, then they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. Remember, king, this is what you said. And the king has to say, yes, yep, this is what I signed and nothing can change. Nothing can change it. Again, this idea of being irrevocable comes out here. So before they even get to talking about Daniel, they say, hey, remember, this is a law and it's irrevocable, and he agrees with that. The setup is complete, and then they drop the bomb, and they tattle on Daniel. And that's really what's happening here. They say, Daniel, the one from Judah, he is the one who now is praying to his God three times a day. So apparently they not only watched him do this once, but three times a day they had enough to accuse him, and so they do. And so Darius is put in a really bad position. I think immediately he realizes his mistake. Immediately he knows things are not the way they should have been. But he is trapped because his law and document and injunction cannot be changed. So Darius reluctantly sentenced Daniel to death. Darius reluctantly sentenced Daniel to death. We see that Darius was obviously fond of Daniel and immediately realized the mistake he had made. Again, this is a difference between Darius and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, it took a lot to get him to realize that he was arrogant and prideful. He had to live out in the wilderness eating like a cow for a bunch of time, the fullness of time, whatever that was. He had to be out there for a long time, eating grass, figuring out that God is the one in control. Darius immediately understands that he made a mistake. There is some humility here, even in a king. And I believe that has something to do with his relationship with Daniel. And we're going to see Darius or Cyrus as we look at this, what is going to happen as a result of his humility. But we'll get there. He tried to find a way out. We see Darius tries to find a way out for Daniel. He, he tries. He, he, all day long before sundown, because that's when the, the, it would have had, the execution would have happened. But he can't find any way to change the law. The law is unable to be changed. Daniel was doomed. We're reading this, and it's like Daniel has no hope. The king, the king wants to save him, but the king can't save him. And by the way, this is a very important point. The king of the whole empire, of what, we would, what he would say is the whole world, can't stop Daniel from having to go in the lion's den. He doesn't have the power or the ability to do it. So we know that there's only one who does, and even the king of the world at this point can't. So as Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, we see a plea for God's deliverance of Daniel. Even as he throws Daniel into the lion's den, we see the reluctance of Darius. He doesn't want to do this. And what he says, and I think this is where he starts to understand and he starts to realize that he is not the sovereign one that can do whatever he pleases. He says as he goes into the den of lions, he says, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. I don't think this is a statement that Darius is making sarcastically. I've heard people preach that before. I don't believe that. I believe he really wants Daniel to be saved and he's finally coming to realize that the only hope for Daniel's salvation and deliverance is God himself. And so he pleads for that as Daniel goes in the lion's den. Darius knows God is Daniel's only hope and we see the seed of faith starting to sprout in him. He realizes that there's only one who can revoke his death sentence 
and that is God himself. There is only one who can revoke the irrevocable law, and that is the irrevocable God. And then we see, the, as kind of a final point to show that there is no hope for Daniel, the, the rock gets rolled over the entrance to the lion's den, and it gets sealed. It gets sealed. In other words, it says, the king has sealed this. No one's going to break the seal. This is final. Daniel's deliverance to the lions seemed to be a final death blow. But as we've gone through Daniel, and as we've gone through all the Old Testament that we've ever preached, we always say, don't forget that the Old Testament does point to Jesus. And this is a quick rabbit trail, and I say quick, so I'll try. But when else do we see an entrance sealed, a stone rolled in front and sealed? Matthew 27, 62 through 66 Talking about Jesus, the next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impo- what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Kind of interesting. As Daniel is sealed into his tomb, if you will, the final death blow through the lions was meant to happen and he was sealed in there. So Jesus was meant to be sealed into the tomb that would prove the final death blow to him. But we know, as we'll talk about later, that that did not hold Jesus. The power of God, uh, he rose again. The sealing of that stone did not hold Jesus in, just like the 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 sealing of the stone on Daniel did not spell his death either but we'll con- we'll talk more about that later Darius doesn't eat or sleep then we see his, his his continuing reluctance he doesn't eat or sleep all night long as he waits to find out Daniel's fate the next morning so he doesn't know he pleads he says God may the God deliver you that you follow and then he goes home and he can't sleep he can't eat he doesn't want anything to distract him he's just in anguish this again I think shows that this is not a a sarcastic, prideful man who's trying to show his dominance, but instead is a humbling is, is someone who is being humbled and understanding that he has no control over his over what happens. This is huge. Nebuchadnezzar, like I said, he didn't get this, but Darius here is getting it. He has he can't do anything about it, so all he can do is just stay awake and just not have any distractions. And he's thinking about Daniel all night long. And so I just think that's another interesting point as we see here. What is the point we see that God is the king of all, Darius isn't, God is. So then finally, our last point in the story is we see the vindication. The vindication of Daniel. Daniel was spared from death by an angel. Darius comes and he asks with cautious optimism if God had delivered Daniel. In other words, did God revoke the sentence he had made? He comes and with anguish, I can just hear his voice just... He wants to be hopeful, but he doesn't really know if he can be hopeful. I mean, nobody survives the lion's den. And he comes and he says, Daniel, did your God deliver you? And then Daniel answered. And Daniel says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. For I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. So we see that Daniel is spared. The death blow, the sealing of the stone, it didn't matter because Daniel is spared as God sends an angel to deliver him. So Daniel declares his deliverance, but he also declares his innocence. Because what we see through the fact that Daniel was not killed by the lions is indeed God honored him and was faithful to him because, again, as he says, he's done nothing to sin against God and he's done nothing to sin against Darius. God vindicates Daniel. Keep in mind, Daniel's name, if you remember what his name means, God is my judge. Well, it's on display right here. Darius wasn't Daniel's judge. All of the other, all of the other politicians, those, they were not Daniel's judge. The only judge that matters is God himself. And God judged him innocent and vindicated him by sending the angel to save him and deliver him. God showed his vindication through delivering Daniel from death. But let's keep in mind what I just talked about is Jesus was sealed into the tomb. Jesus would also be vindicated as seen through his resurrection from the grave. 
Again, we see the picture of what's happening to Daniel and it's going to be fast forwarded and we can see it with Jesus. He's buried, but he rises again and the deliverance is seen because he's vindicated. He was perfect. He was sinless. And so therefore he had the, he was given the power to rise again. Again, God is in control and God will vindicate those who need to be vindicated. And that's what we see in Daniel and we'll see it in Jesus. And we see that Darius was filled with joy and witnessed God's protection. Uh, of one who trusts in him. So Darius was filled with joy. He goes from being dejected and depressed the night before. Now he is filled with joy because he knows that God has shown up and God has delivered Daniel. God has protected Daniel. And we see that Darius is joyful. But then right after he's joyful, he turns around and we see that da Daniel's enemies re received the judgment that they had hoped for Daniel. They had planned for Daniel to die in the lion's den, and what we see is that Darius condemns the accusers to the same fate that they had planned for Daniel. We see here that not only would they die in the lion's den, but also with their families. Now for us, this is very harsh to understand, and it is very hard to understand why this would happen. But in ancient cultures, this is often how it was done. Partially because you're responsible for your whole family, and, but for whatever reason, the whole family is thrown in. God shows his harsh judgment of sin. There is punishment for sin seen here. They sinfully plotted against and planned the demise of God's people, of God's person, of Daniel. We see this throughout the scripture, that people who set themselves against the mighty ruler of the world, who is God, will face destruction. We see a picture here of what God will do to those who do pit themselves against him and his people. But let's not forget that we would see this judgment and this punishment be given through the death of Jesus when he would take that kind of punishment for all sinners who would come to him in faith. So because of Jesus, as we've been looking, about, looking at, we see that there is forgiveness and there is hope and there is not this punishment that comes to everyone who sins because of God's mercy and grace that came through Jesus. That trusting in him and trusting in the condemnation and the punishment that he already experienced for us, trusting in that for ourselves, then we can be vindicated not because we're innocent but because he was. And so we see that to be true even in the story of Daniel. Then we see God, Darius praised God's sovereignty and Daniel, pro, and Daniel prospered. We see that the whole world, and we've been talking about this, this is a figurative thing. Obviously the whole world is the whole empire, which did comprise most of the people of the world, <clears throat> is told of God's sovereign rule and faithfulness to his people through the deliverance of Daniel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember when I said at the very beginning of the sermon, there's two sub-themes that go into the sovereignty, the gospel of God's sovereignty. God is faithful to his people. God rules over all. We see both of those things here in Darius's decree. We see that not only is God the living God who endures forever and that his kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. In other words, God is the king of all kings and no one can rule over him. He is the ruler. But then also in verse 27, he delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heavens and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So those two things that we talked about at the beginning of the sermon in the introduction are seen even through Darius's proclamation. That God is the one who rules and God is the one who delivers. And he is the only one who rules and he is the only one who truly delivers. The decree he signed to draw worship to himself at the beginning of this whole story is now replaced with a new decree for people to worship God. The complete reversal happens. Talk about irrevocability. Well, it's in even more than changed. It's changed completely. And then we also see that through this, Daniel prospered through the reign of Darius, who is Cyrus, most likely. He was preserved through all of the exile. Don't miss this. Why is this line even here in verse 28? So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, the king of Cyrus, the Persian, and the reign of Cyrus, the king, the Persian. So what we see here is that Daniel was preserved all the way through. Remember, he was taken to Babylon right at the beginning of the exile. Young person taken to Babylon. Now he's in his 80s. He's old, but he's seen all of the exile. He's been there. God has preserved him through the whole time because we know throughout other scriptures and what we would see if we did a more deep study that we do know that the Jews do go back to their their go back to their homeland and they do that under the reign of Cyrus the Persian so Daniel gets to see the beginning and the end what a privilege Daniel was given to be preserved that long 
And again, why? Because God was working in him, through him, and speaking through him. The Jews would be allowed to return to their land under Cyrus's reign, and if Darius is Cyrus, which it seems to be, why do you think he would have done this? Well, based on his proclamation of who God is here at the end of chapter 6, I believe it makes sense that, especially Darius being Cyrus, that he would have done this based on the testimony of what happens in chapter 6 and based on the testimony of Daniel. He would let God's people go back to their land because he was, seems to be, a believer in their God. Was this exclusive worship of their God? Don't know. But he does let them go back. All right, so a few implications, and I know I need to be quick. Implications that we see through this story. First of all, I want us to understand that faith is not dependent on our situation, but on God himself. Faith is not dependent upon our situation, but on God himself. So the thing is, Daniel uh, was faithful, and Daniel had faith in God, even though he knew that the lion's den was coming. Even when he's in the midst of the lion's den, the situation didn't matter. The threat of the lion's den didn't stop him from being faithful or having faith in God. He had faith in God because he knew who God was and he was going to be faithful to God no matter what. We saw this with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We also see it with Daniel. But in the New Testament, in Hebrews 11, I I always, this is always so crazy to me. Hebrews chapter 11. This guy was, this also will go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, they said, our God will deliver us from the fiery furnace, but even if not, we will only serve him. That's in my paraphrase, but that's what they say. And I think we see that happening in Hebrews chapter 11. This is the great faith chapter that tells us what faith is, tells us about the people who had faith. Hebrews 11. I'm going to skip around a little bit just because it's a long chapter, but we're going to go verse 1, verse 6, and then verses 32 all the way through 12, 2. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right there. It's not about what we see. It's just about what we know, and that is who God is. And what, who is God? Well, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In other words, God is real and he is faithful to his people. He is sovereign and faithful. What more shall I say in verse 32? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and forced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Interesting phrase there. Quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. I'm going to stop there before I end, end reading. So this is all good stuff. Look what faith has done. It's It's... It stopped the mouths of lions. We see that in Daniel. Maybe it's happened other times. We we see that all these other people have been given great, uh, great justice. They've conquered kingdoms. They've obtained promises. They've seen they've seen miracles. Everything is going great. So that's what faith means. If you have faith, you're going to get all this stuff. Everything is going to go great and perfect and wonderful. There'll never be any problems, and you'll get everything you've ever wanted. That's what faith will give you. Or some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. Whoa! So faith doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes wonderful and perfect and, makes, and that everything I ever want comes true to me. Faith sometimes means suffering. Say faith sometimes means it's going to be a really, really, really bad life. But notice what's said here, that they might rise again to a better life. Because faith is in God and it's in what his promise is. It is not in the temporary. It's not in our situation. That's the point we're making right now. Faith is not about our situation. Faith is about who God is. And so we see all of these, both the ones who had great success in the eyes of the world and those who were tortured and those who had the very worst lives. Either way, both groups of those people who had faith in God, what do we see about them in verse 39? And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should be 
made, not be made perfect. In other words, they never saw the completion of God's plan. They never saw the Messiah that would come to set all things right, to start ruling. They didn't see all that. They knew the promise. Verse 1, so what should we do in, in light of all of that we just said, that the faith that was found outside of circumstance, but in faith in God, even though they never saw it. Again, going back to verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. They knew who God was, they knew what God was doing, they trusted God's promises, even whether it was good life, bad life, and they couldn't see what was happening. They still had faith. Therefore, what should we do? Therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 12, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those people... Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We have God's promise in front of us. It's Jesus and his rule. Jesus gave his life, died so that we could focus on him. He could found our faith. He would perfect our faith. That is what Jesus does, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He died for us. He despised the shame. But then we see he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the ruler. We have seen it. We know it. And so all these Old Testament people that were told about in Hebrews chapter 11, those who had great lives, those who had terrible lives, those who didn't see the promise, we've even seen the promise. And so we can focus on that promise and we have faith that Jesus did this, that Jesus is the one we focus on because he is the one who died for us. He is the one who despised the shame. He is the one who rules forever. And so we have faith in that. No matter what the world says we should, that we can or can't trust God, it, that, it doesn't matter what the world says. We have faith in him and him alone. But in that, in saying that, and I already kind of said it, what we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, faithfulness to God will bring persecution. Faithfulness to God will bring persecution. Do not buy the lie or think that somehow if you just do what God wants you to do, that everything is going to go great and that no one will ever care. What we see with Daniel is he did what was right. He obeyed God. He did what he knew he needed to do, and it did bring persecution. We have the same promise that it's made to us in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Ah, so there's going to be persecutions, but there will be a deliverance. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Doesn't say might be, will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul tells Timothy... You will be persecuted. But what is your hope of deliverance? Your hope of deliverance is to continue in what you have learned. It's to believe. It's to have faith in what? The scriptures that tell us about faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus is where we find our hope. And where do we find out about faith about Christ Jesus? It's through the Bible. And so again, even in the face of persecution, it will happen, but there is deliverance, and we find it through Christ as we read his word. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, I read this at the end of our chapter 3, uh, talk about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, but 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. This trial, in context, is about persecution. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Rejoice. Notice that. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. 
What do we see in that verse? God's sovereign faithfulness, God's sovereign rule. He's the, if he creates, he can rule it. But all that we see in 1 Peter, all that we just talked about, if we're persecuted for Jesus' sake, there is joy to be had because we will see the glory of Christ. So you will be persecuted, but there is hope. Here's what we also cannot miss as we think about the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Ultimate deliverance is found in Jesus Christ, the true and better Daniel. Time does not give us time to read all of Psalm 22. I would encourage you to do that. Psalm 22 is David's psalm, but it's also seen as a messianic psalm. In other words, it is pointing towards the Messiah. It is a prophecy of who the Messiah would be. It is, the, it is the psalm that says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? is where it started. And we know Jesus quotes that when he's on the cross. Also in that psalm, it talks about how David is pleading to be saved from the lions. I believe that Jesus ultimately, through his death and then his burial and his resurrection, is the true and better Daniel. Daniel showed us what faithfulness to God looks like, but Jesus showed it even better and even more through the fact that he not only died on the cross for our sins, he really was, and then it looked like there was no hope. He was buried. He was done. There was no hope. And yet Jesus rises again three days later, which we're going to be able to celebrate in less than a month. We celebrate it every day, but we get an opportunity to celebrate specifically in it less than a month. And that is the hope that we find if Jesus himself, who is literally killed, put in a tomb, and was left to be done away with, then rises again, then that power that was in Jesus to rise again, the power that delivered Daniel from the lion's den, is the power that can deliver us from sin and death. That is the hope that we have. So don't just look at Daniel in the lion's den and think, man, it would be really nice. If I ever get thrown in a lion's den, it's good to know that maybe God will save me. You probably aren't going to be getting thrown in a lion's den. Maybe. I don't know. But that's not the point. The point is you are already thrown into a lion's den of sin and death. You are already put in a place of no hope. We are dead in our sins, as the Bible tells us. And we have no hope to get out of that. We're sealed in a tomb. But there is hope. And that is through God who delivers, through Jesus who gives his life, who gets buried, who rises again, the gospel, the good news to show us that there is hope, that sin and death can't keep us down, that we're not going to be devoured by the lions, but we can have true hope in Jesus and Jesus alone because again, Jesus is God and we've looked at God. He is the ruler of the world and so he is faithful to his people and he rules over all. If that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what will. That is, this is hopeful. Ultimate deliverance comes from Jesus. Even though that means persecution, even though that means that sometimes our situation isn't going to go well, we have deliverance through Jesus, and that is the hope that we have as we even read Daniel chapter 6. Galatians 1, 3 through 5. So the last verse I'll read, and then I'll just give you some questions, and we'll be done. Galatians 1, 3 through 5. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. This is Paul talking to the Galatian church, and this is how he addresses them, and this is how he would even, even can address us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are delivered from sin and death and this present evil age, all the evil and sin and suffering and all of those things, it's ours to be delivered from. We are delivered from the lion's den. We are delivered from the world of sin and death that we live in only through the fact that Jesus gave himself for our sins so that we could be delivered because that was God's will. It was God's will to deliver Daniel. And by the way, Daniel didn't know that, right? So Daniel could have ended up getting devoured by the lions. That wouldn't have changed whether Daniel was faithful or not. He was faithful because he was faithful. And so we are faithful because of Jesus and what he's done for us and knowing that he has delivered us, maybe not temporarily, but he will deliver us ultimately. And we know that that is true and we've already been delivered. We've already been given new life. We've already been spared from the lion's den. And that is the hope, the truth, that I hope that you walk away from Daniel chapter 6. Not with just good morals saying, oh, I just need to pray more. Not with just good morals of saying, well, I just need to be, you know, disobey laws that are against God. Maybe those, those times will come. But ultimately, I want you to walk away saying, no matter what happens, I know who my deliverer is. That is our hope. So some questions as we leave. Have you been delivered from the lions of sin and death? 
that salvation through the gospel, through Jesus, have you received that? Have you come to know Jesus? Have you given your life up and said, I believe in Jesus, that he died, rose again. He died, was buried, rose again. He's coming again one day and that he has paid the penalty for my sin so that I can be forgiven. And if you believe that and you confess that and you turn from following yourself and follow Jesus, that is where you can find deliverance only in that. You can't find deliverance in anything else. And if you have not been delivered from the lions of sin and death, if you have not come to know Jesus and found salvation and deliverance from him, then today is the day you must call out to him. You must. Another question for all of us is, are we worshiping God alone no matter what the cost? Are we making excuses? It's only a question you can answer. And finally, do you find confidence and comfort in God's faithful sovereignty? Daniel found complete confidence and comfort in the sovereignty of God. Not in himself, not in Darius, because again, nobody has any power over anything other than God himself. He is faithful. He is sovereign. He rules over all and he loves us. He cares for us. He is faithful to us and we can trust that and that should bring us true hope and confidence and comfort. That is the point. That's the point of Daniel. That's the point of Daniel chapter six. No matter what the world throws at us, we have comfort We have confidence in our irrevocable God. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity we've had to look at your word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for delivering us, Lord. For all of those in this room and that are watching online that know you, that have come to know your son, Jesus, that have given our lives only because of the grace that you've given us. We've placed our faith in you because of the grace that you've given us and we want to praise you for the grace that you've showered upon us. We deserve to be eaten by the lions. We deserve to have a fate that was given to those who were against Daniel. We deserve that fate. We deserve death and destruction and we deserve ultimate condemnation and yet through Jesus, through death and resurrection and, and the hope of you coming again, we have true hope. We know that you've delivered us and you continue to deliver us. No matter what this world holds for us, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, you are the God of deliverance. You are the God of hope. And would you help us to trust in that? Give us hope, give us strength, and help us to understand your sovereignty more and more each day. I pray all this today in Jesus' name.